In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. We thank you for this day and this opportunity to come together to dive into scripture, um, to uh, learn from one another, encourage one another, to enrich one another. Um, Lord, it is so important for us to, to get together as believers who are all struggling, who are all wrestling with our spiritual lives. We're all desiring to get closer to you. Um, it is so important that we get together, lift one another up, encourage one another along our journey and our struggle. Um, let us learn from one another um, and edify one another through the intercessions of all your saints who have pleased you from the beginning. Here says we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so, um, we last time we finished chapter four, um, we focused last time on this idea of sonship and how <clears throat> the idea of being a true son or daughter of God is the fruit of the gospel. So we, you know, we've been talking all this time about how there's these two paths, you know, the path of the flesh, which we sort of equated to the ego, you know, the things that are of human empowerment, the way that I want to go. Um, and then the way that God is guiding me and wants me to the path that God wants me to walk in. And that's the way of the spirit. And St. Paul is, you know, the Galatians um, in these churches, there's teachers that are coming in and saying, oh, all, you know, let's start following the, the letter of the Jewish law. So let's go back to following all the commandments that Moses and, you know, the Old Testament prescribe. Whereas St. Paul is telling them, if you really try to obtain your righteousness or your closeness to God through that, that doing those works of the law, it's not going to work. There's a new way now that Christ has shown us, and it's the way of faith, the way of walking in the spirit and allowing that relationship with God transform us. And that's why he comes to this idea of sonship, right? Being a son, a true son or daughter of God means to have a relationship, a very close and intimate and loving relationship with him. And it is that relationship that transforms us um, into the type, of, the type of person that we're trying to be, the, the fulfilling and joyful life that is the good news of the gospel. Um, and we've talked about how Christ's life, um, Christ himself was the, be the perfect example of sonship, how he shows us through his life and through his constant deferring to his father. If you, I encourage you to read the Gospels with that in mind and thinking about how Christ is always in constant deference to his father. Everything he does, he says, this is I do as my father showed me. I do this to do the will of my father, not my own will. And that is an example of what sonship really looks like in action. Um, and then we ended you know, with another example um, from the Old Testament of what it means to live in faith. So today, St. Paul is really reaching the climax or the peak of his argument, right? When we're, we spent a lot of time talking kind of theoretically about this transformation of the gospel. But practically, what is that? You know, what does that look like? How can I ask myself, am I walking in the path of the flesh or am I walking in the path of the spirit? And St. Paul presents a very clear picture of what the difference between those two paths looks like. So um, I think this week I'll try to share the, um, like the passage so that if anybody doesn't have their Bible with them, um, they can follow along there. So let me see. Can you make me a host, Abuna? Oh, you did it. You're a Zoom, you're a Zoom pro now. <laughs> no delay. Wow. All right, here we go. Google Chrome. Can you guys see this? Um, oops, that's not yes. what I wanted to share. This is this is my notes. Just kidding. Let me try this one. Hmm. Oh, I think it's just. Uh, oh, can you see the Galatians five here? The Bible. It did show up and then it went away. 
Hmm, let me try again. I'd offer you more assistance, but you'd have to up, you know. Okay. We, we see the reading now. Okay. All right. So can someone volunteer to read just this first paragraph, the verses one through six, please? Yes, I can. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, verse one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Perfect. Thank you, Mina. Um, so let's dive into this. Um, here's my notes. Um, so if we read through this first couple of verses here, He's talking about the concept of liberty, that in Christ we have become free from this yoke of bondage. And the yoke of bondage that he's talking about is the obligation to follow the Jewish law, this need to follow these rituals that he's now saying they're free from in their, in their relationship with Jesus Christ. In verse 2, he says, I indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. It's almost like he's making an oath to them. In verse three here, he says, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So he's basically saying like, if you become circumcised, you're picking your path, right? If you, and remember that when we talked about this in one of the earlier discussions, we were talking about how circumcision was one of the main laws, the main Jewish laws that they followed. Um, and so it's, it represents sort of this ritualistic following of the law even though the heart of that circumcision message was actually about faith. If you remember when we, when we studied Abraham and how he was given that promise from God. Um, but now he's saying, if you try to go that route of following laws and by your own accomplishments and deeds, achieving your closeness to God, it will avail you nothing. He's saying you're going to have to now keep all that entire law, which is impossible. And that's what St. Paul says in other places that there's nobody who falls, who doesn't fall short in something. And everything by our own human power will never be able to keep this, the requirements of the law. We need another solution. So in verse four, he says, you have become estranged from Christ. So you've become a stranger to Christ. You who attempt to be justified, remember justified means made righteous or made good. You who attempt to be made righteous by the law, you have fallen from grace. And so I want to dwell on this verse four for a moment. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be made righteous by the law, you have fallen from grace. So this, this whole book, St. Paul keeps presenting these two paths, right? And now he's bringing this word grace into it. He's saying, if you try to be justified by the law, then you're falling away from grace. There's another passage that um, in the writings of St. Paul, where he really beautifully expresses this message and I want to read it in the light of everything that we've discussed here. So um, please turn with me to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. This is a famous passage of St. Paul um, which I did not understand in this light until I started preparing this, um, this Bible study on Galatians you know, with this new idea of what the flesh means that St. Paul is using uh, in Galatians, it makes this passage from 2 Corinthians make a lot more sense. So, or at least it did for me. So I'll read it quickly. It's, this is the, the famous passage about St. Paul's thorn in the flesh. So reading from 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 7 through 10. He says, and lest I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, 
a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So I hope that that reading that, you know, that connection is clear to everything we've been talking about here in the book of Galatians, that what St. Paul is presenting and the reason why he says it so many times and in so many different ways and in so many different letters is because this is so unnatural for the people that he was writing to, to understand this concept. They've been told so throughout their whole Jewish tradition, follow the law, you need to obey the law, you need to stick to these rituals, you need to follow the law. And now he's presenting them a completely reversed way, right? Where he's saying it's no longer about your own deeds, but it's about the relationship, the restored relationship of sonship that, and daughtership that we have between us and God the Father and with the Holy Trinity through the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, we get to experience, it no longer becomes about our power and our ability to follow the law, but it becomes about our joy at receiving the grace that God freely gives us, right? So if we, if we think about the word flesh as like something from human origin or something from the ego, you can, St. Paul is saying, I was given a thorn in the ego, right? And, and that interpretation actually makes a lot of sense with what he's saying, because he says, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure, right? So he's saying, God has revealed all these revelations to me, right? He's, he's working great wonders through St. Paul, right? St. Paul's, you know, the great apostle, he brought Christianity all over the world, right? You can imagine that in his place, it would hard, be hard for him to stay consistent to that message that he's preaching, right? That it's not about his power. It's not something special that he's bringing to the table, but it's that he's a chosen vessel of God. God has simply selected him to preach the message. But he's saying that God left him this weakness, right? This thorn in his ego, which he begged God to remove from him three times. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So he's saying you need to say, you, you St. Paul need to be aware of your own weakness so that the grace that I'm giving you can become more apparent, more powerful. We have to be aware of our weakness in order for God's grace to really shine through us. And then he concludes by saying he really got the message. After he was praying for this for all that time, he says, now I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses um, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And th I think this is a really crucial point. You know, as Christians, we are called to also have that mind that St. Paul is exemplifying in this. That, you know, we are not comfortable. I'll speak for myself. I am not comfortable when I'm in a situation where I'm at a loss, right? When I don't know what to do next, I like to be in control. I like to say, okay, you know, if this happens, I'm going to do this. I know how to handle all these situations, you know? But what St. Paul is saying here is that those moments where we're confused, where we have no idea what to do, where we're feeling weak, where we're feeling lost, where we're feeling uncertain, those are the moments where God's grace is actually closest, you know? Where we're able to really turn to him with an open heart and say, I don't have the answer here, you know? And that is what that connects so clearly to everything we've discussed, you know, that it's about changing the focus from myself and what I can do to what God can do for me, how my relationship with God can transform me. Um, I'll share a very quick story to, to that in my life that I think illustrates this. This story is, you know, just kind of a personal anecdote, you know, but it, it really stuck with me and it made me remember I always associate it when I think about this concept of God's strength being made perfect in weakness. So there was a, I used to teach Sunday school. I used to teach um, middle school and high school Sunday school when I lived in Boston. And there was one 
um, person that I was really close to, his name was Mario, is Mario. And he, um, we were really close, we talked all the time. And one day I was at the supermarket and we were talking on the phone and he was just really upset about something, just really distraught, you know, and I, you know, love to give people advice. So I was just telling him, oh, you're, you know, just do this, just, you know, and he, we just kept like butting heads. Every time I tried to give him a suggestion or, you know, give him a piece of advice, he, you know, got upset or just like, it, he just kept getting more and more angry and frustrated. And I kept trying to shove more and more answers down his throat. And he just kept getting more and more irritated. And so eventually it just kind of like hit me. I'm like, I don't have the answer, you know, for him right now. Like, even if like intellectually, I might be, you know, my ideas might be helpful to him. He's completely not receptive to it. So it's not really useful right now, right? There's no connection between us. And so I said, Mario, you know, I feel really bad that you're going through this difficulty. Can we just, you know, I don't know what to do for you. I'd really like to pray about this for just a couple minutes. And so we hung up the phone and um, I, you know, I asked him to pray with me. And so we hung up and we each kind of prayed about the situation for like two minutes. And then I called him back. And then the whole conversation was just completely different from that conversation, right? And we, you know, felt that natural connection, that like feeling of love and, you know, and unity that we usually feel when we chat, just like flooded right back. And so, you know, obviously this is a very personal thing, but for me, that's what that represented, was that when, as long as I was trying to do it my way and sort of shove, you know, show him that I had the answers, I wasn't getting anywhere. But when I really asked for help in true humility said, I don't, I don't have the answer in this situation, then the answer was supplied. And obviously it doesn't always happen, you know, immediately like that. But for me, that was a moment that illustrated this idea. So just wanted to share that story. Um, does anyone have thoughts on these first few verses, this thorn in the flesh from St. Paul? I think as, as you're talking, Mark, I was asking myself, I'm like, why is it always so tempting to want to revert back to the law? Like, what is it about it? Because something you said was like, was important where it says like, the law was impossible. Nobody could fulfill it, right? That was the big crutch of the law. Like nobody could do it. Christ was the only one to come and do it. And, and then he took it out of the way. But why is it so, there's some, there must be something so attractive about it <laughs> that, you know, even when shown a path of freedom and liberty, that once kind of tempted to come back, like you come running back, it, it's almost like an addiction. Like, you know, you, you kind of work your way out of it. And then once you get a whiff of it, like you go back. And, and I, I mean, it's kind of like my question. I, I have one word keeps on coming back to my mind, but I'm just kind of curious to see like from everybody else, like why was the law so attractive? even though it was so broken because it couldn't do what it was trying to do. Can I, can I comment on that? Yeah, James. Go for it, James. Okay. Hello, hello, Abuna. Um, so as you're talking, these are the thoughts that are coming into my head because, so we're Orthodox, right? And <clears throat> I spend a lot of, one of, one of my best friends is Protestant. But, you know, we're constantly having conversations about religion and denominations and church and orthodox beliefs. You know, today I'm sending him writings of the early church fathers on, you know, their thoughts of the Eucharist and how it's the body and blood. And, you know, all, I, we're constantly having these conversations. So it's attractive to me as an orthodox Christian to follow these teachings of orthodoxy like sacraments right like this is what the bible says the bible says there's these physical things called sacraments and and you know so we get baptized and and then we we take communion and and this is what we do and we and we and we take confession right and 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 we have priests right and and these are the things that we do and as a protestant he's always looking at these things like 
you don't need any of that. All you need is Jesus and, and loving Jesus in your heart. And all these other things are getting in the way. So my mind doesn't see it that way, but his mind does. Then mm-hmm. that's kind of what I'm, it, it's, so I understand when you're asking what's attractive about the law, there is something attractive about thinking that you have to do something and then doing it, right? And then saying, okay, I've done what I'm supposed to do, right? And that feels good. I don't know. Those are some thoughts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to build on that. That's a that's interesting that you said that, James, about how the reconciliation between you and God are met. You know, I don't have children, but I have siblings. And with one of my siblings, reconciliation can be met very easily through objects and things. <laughs> you know, if I wronged one of my siblings... I know the approach is, okay, let's go to Chick-fil-A, lunch on me, and then it's all over. But another sibling is a totally different approach. It takes time and effort. It takes conversations and working through issues and correcting myself and correcting their self. And it's a whole experience. And I think when God desires reconciliation with us, when we've veered off the path, it's not a quick trip to Chick-fil-A. It's a transformation of the mind and of the heart. And that's very exhaustive for humans because, you know, we live in a world where uh, sin and desires are in us and sin is around us and we fall quite often. And with our pride, it's kind of hard to go back to God and face that transformation we need, you know. So I think for the Israelites in particular, they enjoyed these laws. Well, they didn't enjoy them, but they saw them as a way to reconcile back with God and to say, hey, I can act however I want. I can do whatever I want. So long as I'm following these 614 commandments in front of me, you know, I can, as long as I don't eat shrimp and wear my clothes this way and wash my hands, I'm good kind of thing. So you know, what, what St. Paul is saying, to some people, it might sound much easier. Oh, I don't have to do any of these laws. I just work on my relationship. Great. But with others, it's much more challenging. You know, I'd rather hide behind the laws that God has given me than to actually face myself, confront myself, and have that transformation of heart, transformation of mind, that repentance, you know. So, because I was thinking about that, too, while, while Mark was talking, um, it's just, it is, it is quite interesting how, just through a human perspective, not just outside of Israelites and Christianity, how society as a whole actually craves order and laws and rules. Um, we might think we don't want that, but actually in every culture, in every society, we have found that every place on this earth, people actually want raw laws and rules and they crave it to a point where they, you know, they, there's, there is disorder until rules are made kind of thing. So. Thanks for sharing that, Mina. You know, I think, you know, the, the orderness, you know, I, and James, your, your comments were, you know, I think so on point too. And, you know, we, we touched on some of those points in the discussion. I just want to say one thing to both of your comments. I think this following of the law that St. Paul, that the Galatians were falling into, it takes a lot of different forms now. So it can be legalism, right? And in the case of orthodoxy, right? Even something like communion, right? If we look at communion and say, this is the only, this is all I have to do in order to attain salvation, right? And I just say, I'm just gonna take communion every Sunday and then I'm good, right? That is still, worshiping and putting something above christ himself right even if it's just looking at communion of course communion is an integral part of our worship right but it has to stem from that desire for christ himself right the sacrament should not take over our personal relationship with christ it should be an outflowing of that right if i naturally want to get to close to christ and he commands us saying eat of my body and blood then it's natural to be obedient, right? 
That is what we do out of obedience to Christ and out of the desire to be in relationship and faithful to him, right? But if that action itself, if we take Christ out of that picture, right, and say, I'm just going to take communion for the sake of it, and then not really think about my personal relationship with him, not, you know, have the other fruits of that relationship that come from, you know, my, my daily life, my everyday living with Christ, right? That, that is still, you know, doing what St. Paul is preaching against here, right? Which is putting something, even a good thing, in place of Christ himself, because he really always is bringing back the focus to Christ himself. I really liked what everybody shared. And I think the word that was going through my mind, which I think everybody else articulated, was this idea of worthiness. That as humans, there is a natural desire to be, to feel worthy. Like, and when we are worthy, or when we see ourselves as worthy, then I see myself as somebody who can be accepted in love because I'm worthy of that love. And I think the law and kind of the, the, the structure of it allows you to kind of aim at something that is almost very concrete and say, oh, by kind of checking this off, checking this off, checking this off, I have made myself worthy. And, and that feeling is, I think it's such an essential part of, who we, of, of how we are wired as people because we're always looking for something to tell us how valuable we are. And I think the law allowed Jews to use it to say how valuable they were, which is like what the Pharisees did. They're like, we keep all the laws, therefore we are most valuable. We are the most valuable player of all, you know, all the Jewish people, right? And they use the law to, to find worthiness and, and I think that is such, it is just a natural human inclination to look for worthiness. And, and to Mark's point, like we can even leverage the, our spiritual tools and, and make them laws in themselves looking for value, you know, and, and easy ways of just like, I fast stricter than you fast. Well, that's not the point of fasting. It's not about who's, who fasts more strict right? It's about what is the fasting doing to me. So it's interesting. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's input. That's a really good point of when I like that a lot. Um, so it's, it's, I, does anyone else feel like it's a eternal struggle, this whole idea of like feeling worthy? I guess it's so easy to, I mean, it's, it's so hard to turn off and on because while we're here on earth, I think it's natural, like in our competitive nature to always assess that, right? Like, am I a worthy person at work? Like, am I earning my title? Am I earning my grade? Am I earning my salary? Or like, am I worthy of being a good, you know, husband, father, brother, son, whatever? I think just there's a lot of expectations placed on earth but when you look at like the prodigal son story, for example, the father, I mean, it's, it's like, I was just actually thinking about this earlier this week, you know, forget the two sons, look at like the father's response, you know, his response to his older son wasn't like, you're more worthy because you did more work and you stuck out with me longer and you are more loyal you know, the father's response was uh, a really good illustration, a really good reminder that if you return, if you come back, that is God's reply. He's not going to come back with a to-do list like, oh, yeah, you've been out for five years. Okay, here's, here's the 500,000 things you missed while you were gone so that you can be worthy again. You know, it was the exact opposite, actually. It was throw on a robe, put on a ring, let's get that stuffed calf and let's let's eat let's party you know so it's hard to you know it's hard to flip on and off the switch but that's like something that's I feel like is a constant battle like every day to to remember that I think to your point Mina I think 
social media presents one of the easiest examples to look at of how damaging that search for worthiness can be because I just watched a documentary about social media and, and when you and they were interviewing the person who created the like button and and he said its initial intention was to spread goodness what we didn't anticipate is how it would lead to so much fear and anxiety and depression when individuals don't get enough likes on the things that they post and so they just keep on posting and posting and posting looking for likes and and translate that out that's a search for value it's a search for worthiness of people's attention you know towards them that like button is has become almost the death of society because of how it has manipulated and abused the psyche of individuals who are looking for worthiness. And, and, and now, like, when you look at what social media is done, like the things that get the most likes get the most attention. So now you have everybody on the search to produce something that gets the most attention. So that like button is just, it, it was such a play on the human psyche and how we're wired. And it has caused tremendous damage to the fabric of society, all in the search of worthiness and value. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and I think we're going to touch on this as we go forward on, you know, why this is so difficult to your question, Abuna. You know, why is it so hard to let go? Um, you know, and I think part of that is because there's a dying there. You know, there's a dying to self, um, even if it's something painful, right? Even if it's something difficult, even if it's working 18 hours a day, right? to do it from myself, to do it saying, because this is what I wanna do because this does it for me, right? That is easier in some ways than working a normal day, you know, and then sitting down and, you know, asking what God wants from me and allowing him to lead me where I might not wanna go. Um, and we're gonna to touch on this because I think, I, I really wanna to get to this piece about the fruits because this I really think is gonna to touch on a lot of the points and then I would love to have some more discussion. Um, let's keep reading. Um, this next section uh, is gonna be chapter five, seven to 15. Can anyone volunteer to read that? Are you gonna pull up the screen, Mark? Yeah, I'm just okay. doing that. Uh, can you see it? Oh, here it is, I see. Huh. Stop. Oh, there's a couple. Okay, here we go. Oh wait, was this? Yeah, this, this part. Any volunteers? I can read it. Thanks, Wuna. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind but he who troubled you but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Thanks, Abuna. Mm -hmm. All right. So on this 
go through this part relatively quickly so we can get to the um, the part about uh, the fruits. But he says, you know, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? He's like, and he keeps saying this, like you guys were doing so good at the beginning. You know, what happened? How did you get entangled again? He said that this persuasion to follow the law does not come from God who calls. Then a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So he's saying here, it's just a few of the teachers in this area that are preaching this wrong message, but it's bringing a lot of people into the wrong path, right? It's kind of like the wolf in sheep's clothing that Christ preaches about. Um, it just takes one person to, to lead a lot of people in the wrong direction. Um, he says, I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will have no other mind but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. So whoever's doing this preaching is going to face judgment for it. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. And you remember in our discussion about the cross, that the cross represents this new paradigm of everything being upside down, of us, instead of being strong by our works, we're strong by faith in God, by denying ourselves, by taking his way through the path of weakness, right? He's saying that whole offense, you know, how that offends our human sensibilities, kind of like what we were just talking about, you know, that our natural state is to do things on our own. And so he's saying that's why he's hitting so many walls in his preaching, because nobody wants to hear this message. People don't want to hear, just deny yourself, just trust in God, just have a relationship with Christ. You know, people want to know the practices that they can do to get to the goal. They want tasks. And he's saying, if why would I be going through all this pain, suffering this all this offense, offending people through the cross, if I was just preaching circumcision? If I was preaching circumcision, I would have just told you, just follow these rules. So I'm going through this whole process to switch your, mi your mindset. It's not just to bring you back to where you started. Then he says a very strong statement. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. And that word could mean excommunicate, just leave the church even, because he sees how it's affecting everybody so dramatically. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh or for the ego, but through love serve one another. So he's saying it's possible to use this new freedom as an opportunity just to go back to the old way. And that's kind of like to Abuna's point about fasting, right? We're free now in Christ, but we can use that liberty to just put more rules on and just to start using as an opportunity for our ego. Oh, I'm fasting more than this person. I'm judging them because they're not fasting enough, or I'm judging this person because they're in, you know, they're not Christian or they're not in this denomination or because of whatever. You know, that is using our liberty, our Christian liberty, as an opportunity for the ego. Um, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. So he's, St. Paul here is presenting the primacy of love. How love is the touchstone that we look to to determine if we're moving in the right path. And that's what he's going to touch on here in the next section. So um, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to jump right in here um, and just read this uh, section on um, walking in the spirit. So here he's going to present the signs. You know, he's presented these two paths, the path of the flesh or the path of ego and the path of the spirit. And he's going to present the differences, the fruits. What, what does it look like to be on those two paths? So reading from, I'll, I'll pull it up real quick. And if anybody would love to read, please jump in. Oops. I can read, which, which verses? Uh, let's read, um, let's just read the whole thing, James, 16 to 26, please. Okay. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. 
But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Thanks, James. So um, in the first few verses here, he's again presenting things as a very either or kind of a view, right? He's saying, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to, do, to one another. So you don't do the things that you wish. So he's presenting the way of the spirit as opposed to the way of the flesh. And thinking about the flesh, you know, when I used to think about the word flesh, I just thought it was like fleshly lusts, just like sexual lust or, you know, just like the desires, like the body, bodily desires. But it's actually deeper than that. You know, when you, when you look into the Greek origin of the word, the flesh is anything that comes from human empowerment, right? Which really touches on this concept of ego. So if you read it in that light, the ego, fights is against lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the ego. So there's a battle, right? Between the way of the spirit and the way of the ego. And these are contrary to do to one another. So you don't do the things you wish. There's a chapter um, in the book of Romans, which we talked about as being parallel to Galatians. In Romans seven, I'm not, we're not gonna have time to read it, but if you'd like, check out Romans seven, because there St. Paul really presents those works of the flesh, his own works, just him being so frustrated with his own works of his flesh that he can't get to where he wants to be. He's like, I really have all these good intentions. I want to do good things. I want to walk in the way of Christ, but I don't find myself able to do that. There's all this good I want to do, but I'm constantly getting in my own way. He's saying, that's why we need a solution. That's the solution that Christ is presenting us. That's what he came for us to supply our need, our lack of the ability to live the way that we want to. And he brings us there through union with him. Um, so in verses 19 to 21 here, he gives a laundry list of works of the flesh. He calls them works of the flesh. Okay. I'm going to be honest. Usually when I get to these lists in the Bible, I just kind of like blow through it because it's too many. It's too much. Right. Right. But when I was preparing this, I really stopped to try to understand why is St. Paul presenting these specific things. And I think it is going to be very interesting. I found it very interesting um, seeing the connection between all these works of the flesh that St. Paul presented. So I created a little, um, a little slide where I summarized everything that he wrote there with some modern interpretations, because some of these words are really not in common use now, right? Like lewdness, I didn't really know what that meant. So I looked all this stuff up and I saved it here. Can you guys see this? Okay, huh, that's what I wanna share, I wanna present. Okay. Um, so here's the works of the flesh and then the translation of the original Greek word, okay? So I grouped them a little bit so that we can kind of dive into each one and understand what is the main point that he's presenting with each of these, okay? So the first one is this idea of fornication, drunkenness, carousing. So the translation for that is sexual immorality, placing sexual urges above God's will. And then for carousing, drunkenness is obvious. Carousing is wild, furious, and ecstatic partying, right? So sort of the gist 
or the, the idea here is sort of letting our, you know, like this, you might think of like the works of the, what I used to think of as the works of the flesh, right? So things where like the bodily desires take over and then we do something that's not pleasing to God that we know to be against God's will, right? Sort of letting go of inhibitions. Um, lewdness, I had no idea what this meant. It was a really interesting to read this, but it actually means brutality or violent spite, which rejects restraint, bold lawlessness. So this, this kind of brings to mind this idea of like refusing anything that controls my behavior. Like I'm gonna do what I want, this is how it's gonna be. And like refusing anything that like puts authority, like not wanting to be under the authority of anything, rejecting any restraint, okay? Um, idolatry, to worship, revere, or obey something or someone above God. So to place something above God. Hatred, contentions, dissensions, heresies. So these are ill will, readiness to fight and cause division. Um, for dissensions, it's standing apart, wrongly separating people into pointless factions, seeking to divide. And then for heresies, a self-chosen opinion. So making an opinion apart from the opinion of sort of the predecessors or like, and you know, we think about this a lot in terms of somebody that comes up with a false doctrine that they try to use to poison the well, sort of like what the Galatian teachers were doing that would fall under heresy. So all these four are sort of things that separate, right? Causing division, tearing people apart, right? Causing separation between people. Then jealousy and outbursts of anger. So jealousy is to literally to boil. So that's like, I can relate very deeply to this because I get this really hot feeling inside sometimes when my ego is offended. And like, you know, that feeling like I need to do something in response to that warmth, that warm anger that comes up inside. So that, that boiling metaphor was helpful to me. Then we've got selfish ambitions, kind of self-explanatory acting for one's own gain, regardless of the discord it causes. So putting my own need above everybody else's. Envy means ill will or displeasure at another's good without even longing to raise oneself up to their level only to bring down. So this is really just like, like seeing somebody doing better than you. I don't even want what you have. I just want you not to have it, right? That's envy. And then uncleanness. Actually, Abuna David, in a, in a very memorable sermon when I was in college, I remember it from, uh, what is that, 15 years ago now, gave a sermon about purity and how purity actually means being unmixed. It doesn't just mean sexual purity, which is the only thing I had associated with it, but it means having mixed motivations, trying to please both my ego or some other cause and God, being kind of on the fence here. So this is a lot, but what I wanna draw your attention to is the overarching theme between all these concepts, right? Everything here on this list is about the self in some way, exalting the self, right? giving in to the desires of the self. It's all about me, right? You know, how can I, you know, giving, giving space to my urges, you know, not refusing authority, refusing anything to teach me, you know, revering something, choosing who to worship instead of worshiping God, you know, separating people, you know, um, putting myself between the union that God is calling us to, you know, obeying my feelings. All of this stuff is about the self. Okay, then, um, you know, what he's presenting in opposition to these works of the flesh is what he calls the fruit of the spirit. Okay, and so I made a little bit of a connection here um, between these concepts. I moved the words around a little bit because some of them are really directly related. You can see that they're kind of in opposition to one another, right? So he says the fruits of the spirit. You know, so on instead, you know, I, I put this arrow here um, to represent, oops, sorry. I put the arrows here to represent the ones where there was kind of a clear opposition between the two. And then there's a few that don't exactly fit into the pairings. But if you look at this, you know, the self-control, dominion within, dominion from within, self-control proceeding from oneself, but not by oneself, right? You can already hear that's a very different type of thinking now. 
He's saying, yeah, I'm going to control myself, but it, the power to do that does not originate with the self. That's all actually in the original Greek language, that this is something coming from outside to help me remain under control. Gentleness here sometimes is translated meekness, actually means gentle strength, right? So that's like a power, actually, but it's a gentle strength, um, you know, to like sort of resist uh, as opposed to the brutality of lewdness. Then faithfulness, to be persuaded, to come to trust in God's divine persuasion. And again, this word implies that this is something that has its origin in God, that faithfulness is a gift that is given to me by God. Peace was one of my favorites because it, the, the root word of this is actually to join, tie, to tie together into a whole, right? So peace is, this, is, is really like kind of means uniting, to bring wholeness. And you can, you know, sort of oppose that to this hatred, contentions, dissensions, heresies. Whereas the ego tends to divide and separate and make distinctions, the fruit of the spirit is to join and unite. Long suffering compared to letting that hot feeling dominate me, long suffering is divinely regulated patience, waiting sufficient time before expressing anger. Joy, the awareness of God's grace and favor. So the happiness I feel in knowing the gifts that God has given me. Kindness has this implication of being useful in that it meets real needs that God in, in God's way. It's like goodness that's again produced in me by the spirit. You can see the theme here that this is all stuff God is providing. That's why it's called the fruit of the spirit. And then intrinsic goodness, goodness that comes from God and is shown in virtue. And finally, love, which St. Paul places first, but I would say which sort of summarizes this whole list. Love is actually the technical word for that really means kind of preference, it means God's preference, you know, this divine love, doing as God would do. That is really what that agape or love really has at its core. And so I think these two lists really nicely illustrate what St. Paul is presenting in this whole book, right? That you have this ego, right? That tends to push me into all these things on the left, right? And that denying that ego and taking God's route gives me the fruit of the things on the right. And I think I, I heard in a sermon that the, the choice that St. Paul uses to describe these lists is significant. That for the works of the flesh, he calls it works, right? That this is sort of the natural work. If I just kind of go along with my normal desires, if I don't do anything, then I'm naturally going to end up being pushed into this left column, right? This is kind of what naturally happens as human beings. This is what being fallen looks like, right? And then the, on the other hand, when he talks about the gifts of the spirit, he calls them fruits, right? This is not some like a work that I have to earn. This is a gift that comes, the natural following of having the spirit. When I have that spirit of God, when I submit to God and am faithful to him, then all of these things on the right become mine. I no longer am focused, so self-focused on myself. I'm now doing things for God. Everything on the right-hand column here has its root in God. Its focus is not on the self, but on God. And that's kind of at the heart of the message here um, from St. Paul in this book, right? Is that the focus has to change, right? That it's in recognizing the good news that God has done all the work for me and that it's a free gift to just be grasped. All I have to do is reach out and grasp that gift to take God's way. Then, um, um, that you know, that is the that is the new transform transformation that I'm going through is giving up that ego, the way of myself, and taking God's way. And again, that's not an easy thing to do. You know, as we've been discussing, it's not really um, just like, oh, okay, I'll just follow God. There's really a denial there. There's a placing God's needs above my own that we see exemplified in Christ. So um, any, any thoughts on that, um, on the fruits of the flesh, or the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit?
I really like how you line them up because I've, I've um, read and, and heard that when we think about the virtues and the fruits of the spirit, they exist on a continuum, right? And, and the way you laid it out in that diagram showed that continuum. And, and, and all of us in each one of those categories or each one of those continuums, like we're somewhere on that continuum. And, and the spiritual work and the spiritual exercises that we do are all about moving us towards the side of virtue. And I really like how you said it, that if we don't do the work, then the natural progression is towards the flesh, right? Because that's what the flesh will really do. I, I really like that imagery and, and thanks for putting that together. It was really nice. A thought that popped into my head was that you're you're either a slave to yourself or a slave to God. Pick one. Yeah, that and that's said explicitly in the book of Romans, Mina. I'm sure that's what you're referring to. You know, there's those are the options that we have, you know, and the slavery. But, you know, St. Paul's presenting that slavery as freedom, you know, and as we talked about in a previous discussion, um, you know, once we submit in this again, in this sort of paradigm of opposites that we discover this sort of, um, you know, what St. Paul calls the foolishness of the cross, you know, as when we are made weak, we become strong in Christ. When we deny ourselves completely, that's when we find our true selves in Christ too. It's that slavery that allows us to get rid of this thing that we call ourselves. I think that this is what makes me me, right? But I'll discover a new life in Christ through that denial, you know, through the cross, what St. Paul calls the crucifixion of the flesh, right? Killing my ego. Um, I know we're over time. I just want to end by saying um, the things that come from the ego hold us like chained to these basic, what St. Paul in the previous chapter called the basic principles of the world, right? That those elements of the world are sort of this natural tendency for us to walk in this selfish way that brings us to this place that we don't like to be, this selfish place that we just have a tendency to walk towards. You know, and it's and it's through that um, that we are precluded from experiencing the joy of the gospel, right? And even in Christ's life, we see that he was denying himself and his own will and taking on the will of the Father. And Saint Paul says in this chapter that those who practice these things will re not receive their portion of the kingdom of God. And so, if we think about this concept of kingdom of God, it also kind of comes into new relief when we think about it in this light of my way versus God's way, right? The kingdom of God is where God is king, right? It's where God is ruler, where I'm choosing, I'm choosing to, and I have to make him that, right? I have to make him the ruler in my own life. And so when you think about this concept of kingdom of God, it's not just going to heaven, right? The kingdom of God is something that has to begin here. We can experience the kingdom of God here, we experience the kingdom of God whenever we give up control and put God in the driver's seat, right? And try to achieve, deny these works of the flesh and achieve the works of the spirit, right? Not achieve, that's totally the wrong word, but receive the gift of the fruits of the spirit. Um, and so the, what I'll end with is just by saying that, you know, when Christ talks about um, the false prophets, he talks about, by their fruits, he says, by their fruits, you will know them, right? And so when you think about St. Paul presenting these two opposing paths, the path of the ego and the path of the spirit, um, you know, there's very clear distinction in what kind of behaviors those produce. The works of the flesh produce these, these, um, these works that are selfish and the fruits of the spirit produce sacrificial, loving, um, God-focused works. So the flesh is selfish, the flesh is focused on me, the flesh causes divisions, the flesh harms, causes harm to others, the flesh is dishonest. The works of the spirit are sacrificial, God-focused, uniting, uplifting to others, and, and founded in truth. Um, 
And so this whole trans transformation that we've been talking about in this book, this good news of the gospel that we get to be transformed into Christ's likeness, this is what the transformation looks like here, is when you are transformed, you experience these fruit of the spirit. Um, so we're gonna do the last chapter next time. And then, um, you know, it's a little bit shorter. So I'm just gonna wrap up by sort of presenting, you know, a summary because St. Paul's really giving one message in like five different ways in this book. And so we can kind of look at how, you know, the works of the ego and of myself can be represented by a bunch of different things. And then the works of the spirit by an opposing list. So um, that is it for today. Any final comments, thoughts, questions? I would like to add something. Please. I just, I, I think it's, um, yeah, I agree. And I'm, I appreciate this um, lesson. And I, I just want to point out that even though the, um, you know, what is our natural state is of the flesh, it, it is not a joy. You know, that experience isn't joyful. It's just maybe what our natural state is but it's actually in this freedom and the liberty with God, it's so joyful. And you can actually relate that back to your experiences, you know, where you felt like you're doing your purpose and you're in the right place and you're, you know, of service or you're acting right. And that is so joyful. And, you know, that's, that's the motivation, you know, to be there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, and that's why, this whole thing is about the gospel, right? The message of joy, right? That has to be something that we're working towards. You know, we're working towards the joy of the transformation that comes with God. And we're missing that joy, you know, when we do not, when we're not walking with him, you know, it's just, we can't find it by ourselves and it comes through our union with him. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Sherry. Other, other last minute thoughts? Sorry, we went over. It's a great discussion tonight. It's really nice. Thank you, Mark, for the preparation. Let's close in prayer and we'll meet next week. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to continue to look into scripture, to see the verses that we've likely read so many times, but to see them... Um, deeply and, and to, to find uh, new understandings that would enrich our life and edify us and, and lift us up to truly experiencing your, your true joy and your true love. Through the intercessions of all your saints here, it says we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Your Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you guys, it was a great week. Looking forward to next week. Mina, don't forget to bring the jokes uh, to, to begin. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Yep.